So when we put Bob Dylan on sale, it was, it was, you know, it was magical because oh, it, yeah. it made people think of Woodstock. It made him think of a road trip. It made it think of camping. Hey folks, Brian Smith here with Dream Path Podcast, where we get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. Today we talk to Ken Kinnear. Ken is an artist manager, a concert promoter, and the founder and creator of the iconic concert venue, the Gorge Amphitheater in George Washington. If you've listened to any of my dual casts with Jason over the last six months or so, you may have heard Jason and I talking about how amazing this venue is. I'm going to keep this intro as short as possible because the interview itself is quite long. It goes almost two full hours. But I will say that I do have a close personal connection to Ken through my dad because my dad, who was Hart's tour pilot in the 70s and 80s, got to know Ken through that connection to Hart because Ken managed the band in the 70s and 80s for over a decade. And Ken and I talk about some adventures they had together. But more importantly, we really dig into how Ken created the Gorge Amphitheater experience and what he saw and what his vision was when he first stepped foot on that piece of land and how he turned it into the concert venue that it is today. Ken also talks about his journey into music, into business, and the business side of music, concert promotion. It's a fascinating, wide-ranging discussion. So let's jump right in to my chat with Ken Kinnear. Ken Kinnear, welcome to Dream Path Podcast. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I love the background that I'm looking at now. Tell us about what's going on with your podcast. Well, it's brand new, uh, as you and I have talked, and I appreciate your, over the last year or so, uh, giving me direction and advice as to your uh, ups and downs and perils of podcasting. And so I'm, I'm just, you know, using this as a, you know, as a tool to, uh, to advance the power of music in a whole bunch of different ways. So I'll just have a, you know, series of guests scheduled and, and have a topical output for it and, you know, trying to see if I can have some fun. Right on. So before we dive into your career and the movie, Enormous, The Gorge Story, uh, tell us a little bit more about the types of guests that you are interviewing and why you are focusing on those types of guests. Okay, so uh, the initial um, idea behind doing a podcast uh, was that uh, over the years when I started uh, The Gorge Amphitheater, I always had the idea that I would love to see it in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, I'd been through, you know, many campaigns with different artists uh, and some of them my own with heart and some others. And um, and I really felt that, um, you know, that that's something that the Gorge really deserved. So when I uh, when I wrote my book, uh, I basically my book is uh answering uh, frequent questions that I got asked by people that just wanted to know something about the entertainment business. And, and so when I was trying to decide what to do, I stepped through those questions and then just decided to, you know, have a series of stories that uh, answered the questions. So one is how'd you get in the business? And the next one is um, how'd you find heart? And the next one was how'd you do the gorge? And the next one was uh, how to how to do this carrier classic, which was a basketball game on a uh, aircraft carrier. And then the last one was what's next. And so what I'm what I'm starting with is sort of inviting people to come to the the end of the book and read that first, because what's next is uh, has to do with the a campaign that I'm starting um, shortly in about uh, two weeks. And it's basically a campaign that um, is trying to enlist the help of uh, anybody that's interested in the power of music to induct the Gorge in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And so uh, my, my series of guests are, um, are slated to be uh, 
there are 66 uh, artists that have played the gorge that are already inducted into the rock and roll hall of fame and then there's about six artists that are in the enormous the gorge movie who uh just really talk emphatically about uh the experience of what happens at the gorge and what it's like and what it's like to play there different than other places and so so i am focusing uh weekly on uh an interview uh, with one or more of those artists and talking about all of the things uh, you know their career and then uh how did it go with them and uh and then uh then there are a couple other uh segments within the uh podcast where i tell a story about how the gorge happened and why each one of those elements and particular things that happen, uh, you know, support the idea of the induction uh, into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And then I then I basically uh, tell another story out of the book that that looks looks at um, a different, uh, you know, a different view of the entertainment business and and gives people a real um, by the time we get to the end, it's, um, you know, the book's really um, you know, it's a metaphorical memoir, for lack of a better word, and I don't know that that's practically uh, speaking true, but what happens is all these stories kind of connect to each other and, and let you arrive at some different, you know, different conclusions, and that's what, you know, that's what the, the title starts you off on that journey of, you know, those titles is there's an ask for every seat. Well, that's really, you know, that's a nice, funny title, but but it also is um it's just what uh it's a metaphorical thing about uh the entertainment business and how one it's how did i find a seat for my own ass and then how others in the business can do the same and then how many asses are in seats in the entertainment business that have no business being there whatsoever so there's all of the the dynamic of how all those things happen so um so through the first uh season of the podcast i'm focusing on the period of time that <clears throat> excuse me that the rock and roll hall of fame quote unquote uh puts forward the new candidates for the 22 2022 uh induction so so they so the candidate pool is there in january and decided and then it's voted on between january and june and then uh, then they're chosen uh, by in in uh, June, and then the induction ceremony itself occurs in October, and then it's uh, videotaped and and edited, and then it's shown uh, on HBO. And this this year's uh, uh, show will occur on uh, November twentieth, so that's kind of the kickoff around. Nice, that. So, nice, Ken. So that's the bigger picture. There is so much to unpack there, Ken. Let's talk about the concept of inducting a venue, a non-human, a non-musician into the Rock and Roll, rock and roll Hall of Fame. Is there a precedent for that? Uh, well, there, there is a um, simile uh, in the sense that the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has some um, non-musical, non-band uh, humans that get induction uh, inducted into certain categories and so there's like an influencer category and then there's an early category and so there are different categories of uh, uh, maybe uh, entertainers or uh, business side uh, people executives that are inducted but in terms of um, a venue there there has never been um, any kind of precedent and and uh, you know, on one level, I can understand that, um, but but what what's really the case that has to be made, and the reason uh, that I feel it it can be made is that you know the gorge is just much more than a venue, and when you know it, everybody experiences it in in their own way, but it it just becomes a living, breathing. Uh, participant mm. in every show that comes there and right. and and you know when you when you watch the the gorge movie uh, enormous um 
that's that's one of the striking things that come through that the theme that uh, people have from musicians to fans and everybody else is they have real difficulty in explaining it and and so their their fallback phrases you you just have to experience it and that in and of itself you know really defines uh in in one certain way about why um you know why there why there needs to be uh, why it needs to be inducted and i'm really you know i'm not on any kind of um campaign for venues uh i don't you know it's different and and i'm i only care about uh, you know, what happens with the gorge because uh, it is such a unique place and because, you know, I've had, uh, you know, over 30 years of experience, both in the very, very beginning and then over a long period of time of being able to to quantify and explain uh, what that is. And and the difference, the difference is, and, you, you know, you bring up a good point because the induction um of, of of a band into the into the rock and roll hall of fame i, I heard one of the best I, I i did an interview uh a week or so ago with ann wilson of uh lead singer of heart and we talked about i mean i lived that with them and and we talked about uh you know heart's induction into the rock and roll hall of fame and and she she came up with a good uh, description about how uh you know your relationship uh with the rock and roll hall of fame from her viewpoint was kind of fluid well that really describes it because it's really intangible and you really uh, if you're if you're an artist attempting to get in there there's very very little you can do i mean you can have your publicist say you know beat the drum and say boy this band should get in there and you can you know have a manager call up and try and do it and you know maybe your fan club's done things but but what's different uh about uh our program and of induct the gorge is that we really now have a, a possibility of uh, motivating and bringing together an entire group of music lovers, an entire group of uh, musicians, an entire group of fans and executives who all can just focus on one thing, and that's this one gigantic total um experience giving thing that is really kind of intangible to describe and when you come there you you feel you feel something completely different or feel things that you feel in a much greater uh magnitude and they happen in this place uh you know almost like like magic and so 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 there really is a a tangible um thing that i'm attempting to do through through social media and through, a, you know, a promotion, we're doing promotions where we're, uh, you know, uh, giving away uh, a contest and, and prizes so that so that we induce people to kind of tell us about their experience and participate in spreading the word. And and uh, and we ask, you know, each of these uh, each of our supporters from a musician standpoint to to come in and ask their followers to, uh, you know, lend their voices to uh, this, you know, this basically a movement i mean it's, there's not really any kind of economic advantage in it except that we're just doing something that um you know is exceptional and that really should be done and that uh and that everyone that has ever experienced it can really identify with yes this is a good idea this right. should really happen absolutely so ken the magic of this venue let's talk about that because my perspective in my lens is that of a concert goer. And my very first concert at the Gorge was the Bob Dylan slash alarm slash Tracy Chapman show where the alarm backed out at the last minute. Tracy Chapman shows up. Nobody knows who Tracy Chapman is, uh, blows the entire audience away with talking about a revolution, fast car. Uh, and of course, Bob Dylan is Bob Dylan and he's going to blow everybody away every time. But I was see, 88, I was 16 or 17, and it was the most visceral, intense experience that I had to date. So by that time, I'd been to concerts, you know, my dad had taken me to, to shows and I had met Hart backstage and had um, a lot of concert experiences. But this was one where, you know, I used my fake ID to buy a... a uh, case of beer, put it in the back of my truck, took my friend Dan Palish. And 
it was like the wild west this this venue seemed very new and evolving and the parking was a mess the outhouses were hard to find uh security was you know um uh, hit or miss and but that was part of the beauty of being there you you know that you're part of something that is first of all stunningly beautiful i mean you just cannot imagine a more picturesque location for concerts and the sunset behind the stage and the river and the rocks and the desert there's something so magical about it so that's my lens is that was my introduction to the gorge tell us about your introduction to the geography to the possibilities and the vision that you had and when that started okay so i'll i'll back you up a little bit uh and then we'll we'll arrive at your experience with bob dylan and 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 some uh some background behind it and some extensions of it okay so um you know i had managed heart for a long time i was a concert promoter uh for a long time prior to becoming their manager so you know i was uh able to assimilate a lot of um experience and and knowledge and uh, about music but primarily i was there i was in the business because i'm a fan and that's that's it i mean i love music music you know it was very important to me from the time i was a you know a kid young and so i i really my foundation for measurement of you know what i was going to do is through the eyes of a fan and that's just another that's a viewpoint that i think is helpful because because if i if if i'm looking at it as a fan and take money out of it and take everything else out of it then you know what what how does that experience impact me and how would it impact other fans and that's really a point that i started so um when i was uh, out with heart you know I, I was fortunate enough we went around the world uh i i basically toured you know other countries uh all over every city there is in the united states and i was able to look at um you know every venue that was around there uh to be played in and i saw uh a number a very few small number of outside amphitheaters that existed at the time um they were basically you know hard concrete kind of places some of them had a roof some of them didn't but there weren't very many of them and um what i knew uh uh when i when i came off the road with heart i really wanted to start putting experience back in uh and i wanted to develop uh find an amphitheater that i could do somewhere and i uh and and i i started out just searching for that and i i was armed with um promoting concerts in yakima promoting concerts in spokane wenatchee and all around uh eastern washington and then of course in western washington and i knew the the mentality on the west side was cabin fever you know through the winter and by you know when when the sun would come out everybody likes to go to eastern washington so as a as a starting point uh where i wanted to focus my attention was somewhere in eastern washington um and i was also i was a pilot and that uh i had flown a lot around the world some of which was with your dad and um uh i would fly back and forth uh to concerts and i'd always want to come back after the show at night so i would usually be flying at night and usually flying from some place in montana or british columbia or idaho and coming back and i would always i would i would always cross generally in the vantage or area of where the where the gorge is and i noticed um at uh at night uh one time i was flying and i had the autopilot on and uh so the airplane just tries to hold an altitude and i noticed that uh when i was uh in that area um my airplane would speed up and just literally start going faster the indicated 
airspeed went up and the ground speed went up and I, it was absolutely certain that the airplane was going faster and I could kind of hear the motor just not working as hard. And, uh, and I, the first time I th thought, I, I just thought it was an anomaly and, you know, it didn't make any sense, but I said, hmm, okay. And then it kind of slowly slowed back down. And then it happened again, uh, another two, two times. And I really started looking at it, you know, it was, there's gotta be a reason for this. So, so that drove me to uh, looking at some weather maps and some historical kinds of things about that, that whole general area. I couldn't see where I was. Usually uh, it was at night and dark over there. I mean, you, there's nothing you can see, no lights, no nothing. And so I was you know, drawn to looking around and seeing what I could see. And, and the first thing that I discovered uh, was that uh, that particular area uh, had a, had 310 days, days of sunshine a year. And so I thought, wow, sunshine all yeah. year. What yeah. a concept. <clears throat> and so then I, then I started looking deeper and deeper and, uh, and I found out, you know, I said, well, how did this place get to be? So you historically, you get to go back and there's a, a number of kind of varying uh, degrees of time when it really happened, but basically it occurred uh, some million years ago, and it happened very fast over a few week period of time, and and all of this um, you know volcanic type material along with some water and rocks came through there and just created the space, and um, and then when you looked at it now, all of that Columbia River basalt, a certain kind of rock, ended up uh, on you know of creating this you know this big canyon, and it's very high on the west side of it and the east side it's, it's there's a lot of it so anyway long story short what what was happening to me with that airplane was that the rocks would heat up during uh the day and at night um when it would cool off that hot air would raise up and when the airplane went over them it basically just created a giant updraft uh for the airplane and made it go faster and so wow. literally that was you know, I took that as the gorge was calling my name and saying, you know, hey, come check me out. <laughs> so and, you got uh, the thermal mass of the I rock. I got the thermal mass of the rock. <clears throat> and uh, so that 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 drew me literally to then, um, uh, you know, fly up and down uh, that area uh, in a helicopter. And I'm a helicopter pilot as well and start looking for places and um, and I, I had just from what I could see from the, you know, go, uh, the, from the river itself and going up and down, I had about five locations picked out. And, and then I started looking at them on a on a map and and, and in property sizes and whatnot. And so it, you kind of reduced them to some other areas, some fewer areas that had uh, enough land and enough usable land to park a lot of cars because it's, it's a, if you're going to have a big amphitheater, there's something that goes along with it is a lot of cars. And mm -hmm. it's, it's a sheer math problem of, uh, you know, of, uh, two, uh, you know, 2.5 people per car and, uh, 128 cars per acre. And you come to, you know, how, how much area you have. And so with, uh, uh, two or three, I was down, down to about two or three places that had enough actual land to, and a, and a site. So then I just got, I started looking at it more and more and, um, uh, and I, and I saw, and I heard about, uh, uh, somebody trying to do some, uh, had, had a bass band come in there on an opening night of the winery or something. And I knew the sound guy from Yakima hmm. and, uh, and I, so I called him up and said, you know, are you doing the sound over there? And do you know what's going on? He said, yeah, I did it. It was just for some local bands. And, uh, and he said, uh, you kind of told me about it. I said, well, just tell whoever, whoever the guy is, just, uh, tell him I'd like to talk to him and give him my number. And so within, um, I think a couple of weeks, uh, uh, the gentleman, Vince Bryan that, uh, owned the winery. Champ de Brion, right? Yeah, it was Champ de Brion. That was the name of it. And that's Brian's field. And his name is Vince Bryan. And, uh, and he came over and saw me and, and I flew back over there a couple of times and within an extremely short period of time made a deal with him. And the deal was we, 
we would become, uh, we would develop and finance the development of, uh, you know, building an amphitheater over there that could, uh, you know, a world-class stage and an environment for, you know, large crowds. And, and we had to, you know, we had to have the use of the property and, and enough for parking and all of that. And so there was kind of a, you know, a division of labor in the beginning. We were, we were exclusively responsible for the, for the management of the crowd and the amphitheater and the bringing of in all of the talent and, and marketing and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And his, initially his responsibility was uh, the parking lot, you know, and managing the crowd and uh, the parking and all that. So, okay, mm-hmm. that was, that was our deal. And so, uh, so it was really um, starting with year one, which and was what in, year is this? Okay. So the, 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 Time we made the deal with him was in um, eighty six. Okay, and then in eighty seven was our first season, and and so I needed, you know, as a marketer and as a concert promoter, I needed one talent. You know, you have to have people that will come there and play, and and then you need to be able to market that and convince other people, fans, that they should come there. Well, both of those were monumental tasks because there wasn't anybody that wanted to go there uh, in terms of an a- artist. They went, well, who's going to come see us? I mean, it's right in the middle of the state and it's, it's, you know, there is yeah. no, no, no reason to come there. And then, and then the fans I, I know would go, what, you know, who? And so, <laughs> and just, so my, to, just to, I don't want to be rude, but I want to okay. give some context for listeners who maybe are okay. not from Washington state. Okay. So, so George Washington is where, the gorge uh, amphitheater is correct uh, or, or it's, roughly it's near yeah it's near a small town on i90 uh called gorge so, george washington so so to give the listeners context we have seattle on the far west side of the state and yes. then we have spokane on the far east side of the state yes. and pretty much in the middle we have this no man's land this deserty area that yes. A few farmers uh, have wineries like Chambre de Brion, the Vince's winery, um, and then further down towards Spokane, a lot of wheat fields and potatoes and and whatnot. But this is literally no man's land. Like there, you can drive miles and miles and miles and not see a car, not see a person, and and so this is the venue that you are trying to convince big time artists to commit to playing. And so I just wanted to provide that context. Go ahead. That's, that's an excellent, excellent description of uh, what we were up against and uh, difficult from a marketing standpoint. So I decided what I would do in the first year is uh, sort of a sum of the parts approach. So I, I put together a season of smaller artists who individually couldn't draw as many and and then market it and promote it as a season where you could go to, you know, you could buy a ticket to all of them or two of them or one of them or do whatever you wanted and put as many, um, you know, kind of perks in the deal as I could and and then market them all together. So the first season was uh, you know, Chuck Berry, Ray Charles, Charlie Daniels. Uh, I can't remember who all the artists was. There was six or seven of them. And, um, and then we, I went around and and did press conferences in all the towns around and made it a big deal and had an easel up with the picture on them and would unveil them surprisingly like here's this one and this one and this one and really <laughs> invited you know uh, I mean if I wouldn't make it a big deal who would and so the, right. the but the press really embraced the idea so that was a good place to start and um, and so two things. Two th- seminal things happened that year that that told me that uh, I was on the right track and that things were working well. And uh, one of them was when Ray Charles uh, walked on the stage. Um, he sold well. It was uh, the capacity of the place was, uh, you know, something like a couple thousand people. He nearly sold out. And when he walked on stage. The crowd that was there uh, stood up and gave him a standing ovation, and it lasted for 25 minutes. Wow! They wouldn't stop, and 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 the magic began because he he just connected to that audience in a way that 
you know, most artists wouldn't uh, because they can see. And he he said uh, a number of times shortly after that, he got that ovation and a number of times throughout the show that uh, he had never experienced uh, anything like that in his life. Mm -hmm. And so what happened? So, mm -hmm. you know, I took that as, OK, this is this is really significant because I'm seeing it from the audience and I'm seeing it from the artist. And then um, the second thing that happened was I was um, I was promoting, I think it was David Bowie in Portland, and I had gone down there for the show, and I was coming back um, on a commercial flight the next day, and uh, there were two guys sitting in front of me, and uh, one started to tell the other, uh, he said, wow, uh, I saw Charlie Daniels over this, over this place in eastern Washington on the Columbia River. He said, you you have to go to this place. I've never experienced anything like it. And I'm going, okay, there's unsolicited testimonial nice. from one person to another. And, yeah. and that's what, that was my whole thought, you know, is that um, uh, people will embrace this and make it their own if it's really, you know, exceeding their expectations. And, and so, uh, so bottom line is that we did well, uh, with the first season as well as could be expected. And we established some identity mm -hmm. uh, for the place. And then uh, the goal became uh, in the following year, I really wanted to try and find uh, an artist that could uh, convince, uh, that could do some business and could, vin could convince other uh, artists in the entertainment business that this, uh, this place had value. And um, and so th this time I had more time and then we we looked to expand uh, the whole thing. And and, and the, the geography of the site was a little difficult because there was a sheer bank right behind the stage that, mm -hmm. you know, that lessened the amount of room that's in front of the stage. And it was a very small postage stamp type stage. So. So one, we didn't have enough room for seating and we didn't have a big enough stage. And so I, I started a campaign uh, where I took some uh, earth moving belly dump kind of uh, earth movers. And, and we started digging out, you know, going south against the against in the seating area and, and creating more space there. And then we took mm. all of that dirt and rocks and went around and dumped them over the cliff where the stage was. Uh, was and could be so bottom line out of that we picked up about another hundred feet of depth uh, and then I put in a, a real live rock and roll stage and you know concrete pilings 40 feet down in the ground and all that kind of stuff and so so we we were able to increase the capacity um, you know to something much you know much greater and it in that and in that year we went from uh, continuing to do that w work, we went from um, 3,000 of small up to about 18,000 uh, by the time it got to Bob Dylan. So, oh, wow. That's a big expansion in one year. Big expansion, but but necessary if you're if it's going to be, uh, you know, attract artists that mm -hmm. that can do business. So so the the uh, exercise of of acquiring now we've got a place where they can work and now I can you know, kind of afford uh, to pay artists the kind of money they need. Now it's finding someone that that could do the business. And so um, I, I just kind of surveyed the landscape and 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 looked for someone uh, who could be inclined to do it. And 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 basically I centered in on Bob Dylan because, you know, artists have peaks and valleys in their career and 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 bob was you know, somewhat of a valley playing a th playing little 3000 seaters and so uh he wasn't making that much money in the grand scheme of things so um i made him an offer that was triple the amount of money he was making and said you know come over and play my 12000 seater which is approximately what it was at the moment i was giving him the offer and um and and then so the package that that was that he was touring with was uh, had the alarm on it. So, uh, you know, bottom line, I was able to uh, convince him to come over there. And uh, but then I wasn't you know, I wanted to 
add somebody to the show that I felt would be complimentary to him and, and also be a draw. And Tracy Chapman had a you know hit record out and was new. And so I was able to get everybody's approval to put her on the show. And then at that point, the alarm just kind of dropped off. So mm -hmm. it was a, it was a result of, of the show that we put together. So when we put Bob Dylan on sale, it was, it was, you know, it was magical because oh, it, yeah. it made people think of Woodstock. It made him think of a road trip. It made it think of camping. It made him think mm. of different things. And then, and, and, and they really, there, there wasn't that much expect, expectation about, uh, you know, they hadn't, nobody had been there. So it wasn't return visits from all that many people, but then what it, you know, how it might be when they got there. So, so then uh, we, we had this plan in work where we were continuing to make it bigger and Bob Dylan sold out the 12,000 seats. And so I was able to go back to him and say, okay, well, we got some more seats we can sell. I'll make you a, you know, a little better deal. And, and can we sell the rest of them? <laughs> which they did nice. and we did and so it went up to 18,000 from the, went up to 18,000 yeah. seats okay. and that's how many we sold and um and admittedly your description of of how, you know kind of how it was 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 accurate it was uh but 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 there's some inside baseball um you know kinds of things uh, that went on and so uh, you know everybody plays into um how, how a concert is going to go. And in, in this case, uh, you know, Bob Dylan didn't want to go out and do his uh, sound check. And it, for reasons unbeknown to me, uh, <laughs> okay. but, but these things happen and they're, you know, life in the fast lane. So, uh, so time went on and on and on. And of course we can't open the gates to the theater until such time as the sound checks are over because they're private. And, and so anyway, it was, uh, and, and it was a gates were supposed to open, you know, at six and he didn't get his sound check done to even seven. And then by then we had no alternative. I mean, the parking was backing up and the people were backing up. And so poor Tracy Chapman didn't get a sound check because, you know, Bob's ran long and he didn't take it at all. So, mm -hmm. so the complication then of, of what happens of order, you know, keeping order happening, it becomes a little more difficult. And so anyway, we had to let people in late and, um, and so it, you know, it made it a little more, it made it more, a little more chaotic in there, but, but like you said, that, that didn't stop the magic. I mean, people, it was just, an indescribable experience. And, and from my perspective, it was one of, uh, you know, one of Bob Dylan's, you know, you know better performances, uh, you know, on, you know, on that show and Tracy Chapman, you know, of course was great. And, and, you know, kind of the rest of the, you know, the historical stuff about Bob Dylan uh, really is history. But what happened after that was that we had a, a convincing argument that here was somebody that was playing, you know, 3000 seaters the day before we bring him over here and he could have sold more than 18,000 and, and it was spectacular. And then uh, I was able to then just start, you know, booking larger bands and every single band that we brought in there would do, you know, multiple, either multiple shows or, or double or triple the kind of business that were, they were doing anywhere else. And there is only one reason, you know, that that happened. And that is because of the venue it is because of the, you know, the whole way that the, um, the, the spirit of it expands itself to people and people tell other people. And it was just, it was come to the gorge and see something you've never seen before. Yeah. And, uh, and you experienced it. I did. And going back to that magic, and you you were talking about the the road trip aspect of it, the Woodstock mm -hmm. vibe, mm -hmm. and of course, I was so young, I had no frame of reference back to Woodstock, mm -hmm. so everything that I was experiencing was brand new, and I didn't know, I didn't have a vocabulary for it, but I knew what was happening was special, mm -hmm. and even after the concert, when there was utter chaos trying to get out of the parking lot. Mm -hmm. Number one, trying to find my car. 
Um, I think I walked around for an hour with my friend, Dan, trying to find my Mm -hmm. car and then trying to get out of there for another hour and a half or so. It was so fun. It, people think getting stuck in traffic is like hell. This was one of the most amazing, memorable experiences I have for my teenage years. Mm -hmm. And then the follow-up of planning trips with friends making an, a, a camping experience, an overnight camping experience in the parking lot. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it makes it just such a special venue. And so I think you're, you're not giving yourself enough credit when you say the reason was that it was this venue that sold these, put these asses in these seats. Mm-hmm. I think it was your vision for this venue that put those asses in those seats. And um, I just want to say kudos to you, Ken for creating what has become, I think, the most iconic ven- outdoor venue in the country. Well, thank you. And, and I mean, there's, you know, there is an element of truth in that, in that, you know, I mean, vision is one thing and being able to, you know, act upon it and, uh, and, and then be lucky enough that, you know, my whole life in the entertainment business was being able to, um, you know, find things that, you know, appealed to me at what, when in the future they might appeal to somebody else in terms of music. And mm-hmm. that's not, that's nothing more than a love of music. But then the point you're making is, you know, I, I had the experience by that time and, and I had the skills enough to, and from a marketing standpoint, to be able to take all these pieces and, and figure out a way to put them together so that, uh, you know, they could be, they could be actualized uh, by others, and I have a, I have one a follow-up story on the gorge, which kind of points to these things that we're talking about. So, twenty-some years later, uh, uh, my my doctor, uh, the uh, physician that you know that I went to for physicals and stuff was retiring, so it was the last time I was going to see him. I had seen him years and years, and and he, he you know he knew I was in the business. He kind of knew what I did. And so I'm going in to see him and he's an elderly gentleman in a white jacket and stuff. And he was telling me a story about his daughter who uh, had written uh, a review about Bob Dylan for social media that wasn't complimentary. Bob was back and playing the Paramount again. And uh, and and she wrote a, you know, not a complimentary uh, review of Bob Dylan. And, and so he was saying, you know, it was kind of he was just telling me you know, that his daughter was having a hard time behind that. And I said, well, you know, Bob Dylan is just one of those unique people that sometimes he has ups and downs. And, and I said, I've, I've seen him many, many times. And I said, the place I've seen him where he was at his best was uh, the first time I, I did him at the, at the Gorge Amphitheater, you know, years ago. And at the point I said that I, I I was looking at him and his eyes kind of glazed over and, he looked at me and said, yeah, yeah. He said, my wife and I went to that show and we took acid. <laughs> and he said, and it was the best experience of my life. That's hilarious. Uh, yeah. And then he spent like 10 minutes telling me about the attributes of, of medical attributes of taking acid and all that <laughs> kind of stuff. But, you know, so you, your statement about you've never forgot it. I mean, that, that I so I have. I have so many different stories from people about that, about that uh, event. I, I've, I have a, a, another guy that uh, I know that uh, told me his story and exactly similar to yours and the whole experience in the parking lot and how all of that became part of it. And um, he, he had his two tickets to Bob Dylan, which he gave me uh, that were unused. You know, I mean, they weren't, hadn't been stamped, torn or anything. So I have, pictures of those are going to be in my book because uh bob dylan is such a memorable you know, uh-huh. experience but you know everybody so that's that's the whole deal and you know that you've hit on another thing that makes uh makes this campaign to get the gorge in the rock and roll hall of fame is now uh you know it, it is a place that promotes um community yeah, and togetherness yeah. that's so and, true you know, and for some number of hours or days, uh, take Dave Matthews and any of the three-day festivals that go on over there, uh, over a million people have come through the 
doors of the gorge to see Dave Matthews, a million people. Mm. And, and now we have, you know, watershed and, and all these uh, electronic musical uh, music festivals. Well, people come together for one thing and that is they, they love music and, and a community gets created and, it's great and there's nothing weird going on and, and we're coming together. And when it's, when you have a, you know, difficult times like we've been going through and you can kind of add up and look around at all of them to be able to come together and, and have a, you know, a place that builds really does build a community. And that really happens over there because, you know, they, the shedders are the shedders and the labor Dave weekend people are the labor Dave weekend people and they're diverse entirely but yet it's a place where people can come together. And that's just yet another thing that for, as far as music is concerned, is difficult to see on a recurring basis mm -hmm. anymore in, you know, yeah. you know, where we are. We're, we're longing for that connection for that community, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. after the pandemic, or I shouldn't say after, but during or mm -hmm. two years into the pandemic mm -hmm. where, and, and I did not go to the Brandy Carlisle show. Mm -hmm. That was there. Uh, I think she played in August, mm -hmm. but I saw on social media what was happening mm -hmm. and, and how special that was. And it, it just brought back all these memories of the shows that I've seen there over the years. And it was like, yes, it's mm -hmm. even the, even a global pandemic mm -hmm. cannot shut down the magic of this venue. Mm -hmm. and, That's uh, so true. And I was there for Brandy. Uh, and, and that, you know, there was a, there's so much, um, of what you're talking about was involved in those few shows because that, that, that played because they were canceled from the year before there were right. ones that had been on sale and, mm -hmm. and it was fish and it was, uh, uh, Dave Matthews and it was Brandy Carlisle. And so all of those uh, artists had to live through and the fans had to live through the, Oh, I bought my ticket and I want to go. And now I can't, and is she ever going to come here again? And all this. So this was a, a, a incredible seminal moment in, uh, you know, just being able to come together and, and, and Brandy, uh, was spectacular and she, you know, in and of herself is a incredibly unique, um, artist when it comes to her, uh, experience with the gorge because she started you know outside the gates playing a guitar sleeping in a sleeping bag you know <laughs> wishing she could get in and right and the evolution of her career uh through you know through help from dave matthews and and her incredible talent uh you know brought her to the point first she opened for dave matthews and and then now and now she's got she's headlined there a few times and she's really building um, you know, uh, uh, an event that people are looking forward to and it's, and, you know, it's not going to, not going to end. And, and that's, was one of the things that you heard, uh, from the stage and she, she, uh, uh, live, live streamed that, uh, that night too, to everybody could see, but she just, you could see her connection and genuine affection for, you know, for the gorge and, you know, it's fantastic. And she's one of the people that I want to go to, to, you know, to help in our campaign to get the, you know, the Gorge and the Rock and Roll oh, Hall of Fame. If anyone can do it, it's Brandy. Absolutely. I mean, she's got a huge following now. Mm -hmm. um, I want to share with my listeners my personal connection to you in this time frame, and it goes way far back into the 70s. But in this time frame of 1988 and uh, through the early 90s, uh, my dad, Greg Smith, uh, your friend, would uh, in any, any time I wanted to see his show at the gorge, I just had to call my dad, ask him to call you and put me on the guest right. list. And, and I think the question was, uh, how many people need to be on the guest list? Brian plus how many, and it, right, it, right. it was unlimited. I, I could bring 10 or 20 of my closest friends and we got to see, uh, artists like Fleetwood Mac, um, and geez, Emerson Lake and Palmer, uh, Steve Miller, you name it, James Taylor, uh, you know, those experiences, you cannot, you cannot overemphasize how formative they are for young people to, to be able to have that adventure of hopping in a car, having a road trip, the adventure of finding your parking spot. And, you know, are you going to camp overnight and, and what's going to happen at these shows? And, 
you know, these, uh, these psychedelic experiences described by your doctor, you know, I can, (laughs) I I can relate. I can relate. I remember at uh, the Steve Miller show and, and uh, sitting there on the terraces and uh, experiencing a psychedelic experience with my friend Ed. And there was this uh, moment where someone dropped, I think a banana peel. I was sitting there, everybody else is standing up and I'm sitting there with Ed because sometimes you just need to sit down Mm -hmm. and somebody dropped a banana peel and then someone else like dropped an apple core and then someone else dropped like an empty bag of chips. And there was, I think it was the most comical uh, moment where over time piled on top of our legs, we were sitting cross legged (laughs) on the grass. We were covering another people's garbage. (laughs) People were... (laughs) But we we weren't doing anything about it. We were just sort of accepting that mm. this was where people were dropping another their, experience. So to yeah, speak. and it was so. It's it's still to this day one of when I talk to my friend Ed, it's like one of those memories that we'll never forget. And it sounds ridiculous to other people when I describe mm. how funny mm. it was and how how special that was. But that's what concerts do sometimes to you, and also mm. of course psychedelics. But. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that, and then just the community of folks that, uh, you know, another story I have was I was at a Steve Miller show and there was a, a man there who, this was before security really prevented a lot of alcohol from coming in. Right. So there was a turning point where it was really hard to get bottles of liquor and wine into these venues or this venue. And, um, we're there with friends we're underage. And we weren't able to get much alcohol into the show and uh, we're enjoying things, but there's this guy next to us. He's much older than us and he's partying with a much younger woman than him. You could tell it was almost like a midlife crisis Mm -hmm. sort of uh, girlfriend that he had. And he had a cooler. I don't know how he got it in, but he had a cooler with all kinds of liquor and he just opened it up to all of us. Oh, wow. Like, and he's dancing around and he eventually over time, he gets so drunk that he falls down the terrace and the terrace below us, there is a person, a little person in a lawn chair. And it turns out um, this man that was drunk and fell down, fell onto this person who was a midget or a a dwarf Mm -hmm. and um, fell right onto that person. And, and that fortunately the person in lawn chair did not get hurt. And it was, you know, the girlfriend got so upset. She just left him at the show. But uh, several years later, I was working at an espresso bar and the man who had hired me at the espresso bar, I won't say his name, mm-hmm. got to protect the innocent here. Mm-hmm. Um, he was talking about, we were just talking about concerts and how one of my favorite concert experiences was Steve Miller at the gorge. And he said, well, you know, I saw Steve Miller too. And we determined that we were both at that same show. Mm -hmm. And then I told him this funny story about how we were with this guy who got really drunk and fell on a a little person in this lawn chair. And it turns out it was him. And and so he, he told me that he had just gotten divorced and it was a midlife crisis moment for him. And it was, you know, a, a younger woman that he was dating and, uh, and it's, it's a f- the funniest connection in the smallest world that we live in, where you can be in this venue with 20,000 people mm-hmm. randomly run into this drunk guy who is giving alcohol to, you know, all these <laughs> underage kids. And, and this event happens again, another memory that, um, is etched in my brain forever. And I hold on to that as, uh, you know, one of the more hilarious and special moments in my, my teenage years. Mm -hmm. And that's because of, uh, of this venue and the opportunity that it gave so many people to get together. And Mm -hmm. yeah, it, is there craziness there Mm -hmm. and chaos? Yes, there is, but it's something bigger than that. That's Mm -hmm. happening. It's um, there's, there's things, there, there are relationships that are being formed. There's connections being made that last a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And that's really true. And, and, and you've really, you know, nailed, uh, you know, the continuum of how people feel that have been lucky enough to go there and embrace it. And 
and then, you know, continue to go there. And, um, and so, you know, my, my feeling about, uh, you know, embarking on this campaign is really uh, one of, um, of doing exactly that in as many ways as I can. And certainly in the beginning, it's not going to be that, you know, a million people or, you know, whatever can flock to the gorge and get there and see it. But, but through a number of uh, ways and you, you know, you've seen enormous uh, the film that, you know, that uh, at some level does an incredible job of cap one capturing some of the you know real life emotion about the place and then showing you know which is again difficult to do uh you know in a film but it really it gives people a sense about uh why they should be there now the reality is that that by this point in time that you know the gorge has sold tickets to uh every every state in the union have bought a ticket every province in canada and something like you know over 60 countries around the world now you know that's a in the grand scheme of things that's a that's a large accomplishment but still in all there's there's you know it's there's a lot more people that that you know we need to you know and here we are in the northwest i mean we suffer up here from uh identity crisis after identity crisis because you know we're not on the way to anywhere you know, and then as a concert promoter, that's the first thing that I learned. You know, you either you're going to Alaska or the Orient. And other than that, you know, there's it, this is a turning point. You either have to turn around and go back someplace or turn right and, or, you know, go somewhere. But but and that happens in our sports teams. It happens in everything. And so so my view is that when you know, when we have something like this that is. Uh, so unique and so well established and so magical that uh, you know we just need to give it help yeah. and and really what the deal is is you know we just become the voice you know and we we have to spread the word and we become you know become evangelists for uh, you know for the place and it's a it's a nice problem to have because you know we're speaking from the heart generally everyone that has done it and so we can as best we can, you know, communicate it. And then it's just another, it's another way that, uh, that everyone that has supported it thus far uh, is, you know, acknowledged and rewarded. Cause that's really, you know, that's the reason I mean, right. people just, people just come there and embrace it and, and have that feeling and spread it. And then, and then it's a, you know, it's another, it's another community builder and, and a place where, you know, we can we can lay lay claim to the Carnegie Hall of uh, outdoor amphitheaters, so yes. to speak, and yes. uh, and and so so it's just uh, you know it's just a you know a, a continuing kind of ongoing uh, effort to make it happen, and and the experiences that you talk about, I mean, everyone gets those. You know, I was um, I was lucky enough to see Stevie Ray Vaughan there and and my gosh it was like nothing I've ever seen I saw him there twice I saw him in that last just a few weeks before he uh, he died and I you know I personally and I I said this in the in the in the enormous film and I tell everybody about it, I've really never seen anything like that particular show in that, uh, you know, the connection like Ray Charles had and like others have had, but the connection for him was was really amazing. And, and it happened with the audience and everybody else. And, and he seemed to be just almost floating on the stage across around and the mm -hmm. music was contagious. And and I saw him afterwards and, and got to talk to him. And I talked to first time I saw him was he was playing on the street in Manhattan. And uh, and I, I, he signed a poster for me and you know i've got it to this day i think it's i think it's in the enormous film as well but you know that idea of experience is really what you know what we have to try and convey and and that's you know that's just going on and on and on with right. uh in duck the gorge and well mike mccready talks about that in the documentary as well and excellent seen, exactly. seen stevie ray vaughn there yeah. and how that really he he attributes that experience yeah. to his musical awakening and yeah, his he had trajectory. He put his guitar down. Yeah, he wasn't playing anymore. Right. 
Yeah. And then you have this super fan in that film, yeah. Enormous the Gorge Story, mm-hmm. which I was skeptical about when I first saw her. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, where is this going? You know, it's mm-hmm. just a, a fan. And then you realize that she was there. She's a historian. I mean, right. she, she was there from the beginning. Right. And then the the story about her sister, and I don't want really to give too many things away, but there's this mm-hmm. very touching story about her sister who went to all these concerts with her. And um, tear, it brought tears to my eyes. Yeah. This, this film is special in that way because I think in one hour, it tells the story that you and I are talking about mm-hmm. in a very visual way mm-hmm. with testimonials from people like Dave Matthews and Mike mm-hmm. McCready and mm-hmm. uh, Jason Mraz, mm-hmm. uh, but also has an emotional component to it that I was not expecting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and they did a they did a really good job that way in in personalizing that that element with the fans and 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 making you know making that connection and then they the same thing with the artists and when you listen to Mike McCready and you listen to Jason Morantz I mean those those are unbelievable stories those are stories that really you know can't happen in terms of you looked at the statistics or anything, anything that you'd say, well, what are the odds of this happening or that happening? It's probably what are the odds of the gorge happening? Same kind of thing. Right. But, but there's, there just tells you that there's, you know, there's more happening. Uh, there's more happening. And those are the things that, that, that uh, bring the power to the place. I mean, not only is it the power of music, of course, but it's, it's the connection that people have and it's still our ability to, you know, to come together and to embrace, you know, embrace music and, 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 you know, really enjoy ourselves. Well, you know, talking about Jason Mraz for folks who, I I don't want to spoil too much of this film Mm -hmm. because it's only one hour long. It's not a big Mm -hmm. commitment to watch, right? right. but there is a story that Jason Mraz tells about Mm -hmm. going to the Dave Matthews show, playing the Mm -hmm. side stage at the Dave Matthews Mm -hmm. show and how that was a turning point in his career, in his life, that is still reverberating to this day. Mm-hmm. So if you want to, for listeners who want to hear that story from Jason, uh, go see this film and yeah. get, get behind this movement of Induct the Gorge. Uh, if, even if you've never been to this venue, um, do that. You know, if, if you can't get behind it without seeing the show, I understand, or seeing a, a concert there, I totally mm-hmm. understand that. Mm-hmm. But this is a very special venue. So even if you don't live in Washington, get over here and see mm-hmm. a show at the Gorge and see what Ken and I are talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, check it out on YouTube as well. I mean, you can just see on YouTube and still feel that magic as you're watching it um, happen. You know, on a on a 12 inch screen or even on your phone. But um, Ken, I, I want to. I would be remiss if I didn't go back before you started the gorge mm. amphitheater mm-hmm. to how you got into entertainment in the first place what was your calling into that industry and how did you get your foot in the door uh, yeah it's a it's an it's a unusual but interesting and and i had a i had a plan by the time i came into it so um uh i i went into the military out of high school and that's a whole <laughs> unusual story of how I ended up in there, but I, I was worthless. You know, I was a worthless kid. I didn't care about school. I had a, I didn't go to school. I had to go to three, took me going to three different high schools <clears throat> to actually be able to graduate because I wouldn't attend enough to them to get paid. So they'd kick me out and I had to go to <laughs> another high school. And so it was a kind of a community effort to, you know, to get me out. And, uh, and I made a deal with my mom. I said, oh, okay, I promise I'll graduate, but <clears throat> but you just have to kind of help me have excuses so that I don't have to go all the time. And the bargain she made is, okay, I'll do that. But, but then you have to go to church every Sunday. I said, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> so that was our kind of uh, <clears throat> deal. So uh, I went in the military um, and then that really changed my life. Uh, I, I figured out a, a whole bunch of things and uh, I ended up uh, being able to go to officer candidate school and, um, uh, I, I got a commission in the artillery and and then really learned that, uh, you know, if you apply yourself and you try to do something, maybe you can succeed at it. And um, and so so when I got out of the military, um, then I went back 
and I knew I had to get an education because I didn't know anything really. And so I went to a community college first and I, and I studied engineering just because I knew a guy that I, you know, that was a captain that I worked with and he was an engineer and I thought he was a pretty nice guy. So that's what I would do, which is really not much direction in that. So after 26 quarters of math and, uh, and, and, I had an epiphany, and I'd, by that time, I'd got into the U, uh, UW. And so, uh, University of Washington? University of Washington. Okay. And I was a student there, transferred, you know, graduated, got an associate arts degree, and then went to the U. And, and uh, I was a commuter, and uh, I, had, uh, I had broken my nose. And, I, and so I had, I had to f- had surgery on my nose, and I had to, it was all packed up with stuff. And I was miserable, and I was going, still going to class, and I was walking up there and every step they had like a thousand some steps I had to go up from the parking lot and every step I would take it my head would bang a little harder you know but just trying to do this and I was going to a class and I just stopped for a second it was raining I had an umbrella and I thought man if I could do anything I wanted in the world right now what would it be and and I st- stood there in the rain I thought about it for a minute and I said well uh I want to get in the music business. I love music. I had a, I had an ear for it, and uh, I just thought, screw this. And I made a right turn. I went over to the school of business and got out of the school of engineering, joined the school of business, and started there. And then I sort of accelerated my my plan because I now I was going okay. I know what I want to do. I don't want to grew around with this school stuff. I just want to learn as much as I can. So I started out auditing things. And then after that, I went, I don't even care about auditing. I just want to go. So then I just started attending, you know, in big classes. Nobody knew who was there and who wasn't. So I was just there learning as much as I could. So I went, took an accounting, business law, economics. And uh, I went, so I went another year and a half just like that. You know, it's free. Just yeah. Well, I didn't. <laughs> uh, who, nobody kept track, and you know they didn't care. And so I figured if they didn't care, well, I would just learn, sit there. Yeah. So I so I learned a lot of stuff, and then um, uh, uh, I decided. You know, I was working on my idea to get in the entertainment business, and so then uh, I needed to. F- I didn't have any money, so I had to figure out a way to get some money, and uh, and and and. I, I had been in the library and I kind of, I, I learned about this, this uh, financing tool that was, that's used in the, uh, uh, in the auto business. And it's a deal where you could write something called a draft and you could draft somebody for a car in another state and you could get the car and the draft was a, as it was a, on a check that looked like a check except it was an envelope and then they'd get the title and they'd put it in there and a month later that it hit your bank and you'd have to pay for it well by then you could sell a car so i started buying cars in mass uh it took me a little bit of time but i would buy them from rental companies and leasing companies and all of that and then i'd look somewhere else where i could sell them in another state so then i just started mass buying cars not in i could finance them through this draft system and i wouldn't have to pay for them till after i sold them and so then i was able to you know just get some cash doing that Mm -hmm. and then i um i bought a uh there was concerts to west was the biggest concert promoter in the world uh was in seattle and they had what was her name Concerts West. Concerts they had, West. Yeah, so it was Danny Kay, Pat O'Day, Gene Autry, a bunch of old school entertainment people that came together and founded Concerts West. And then uh, and they had some younger guys in there running it, but they really invented the touring business uh, per se. And so they were doing, you know, Elvis and the Carpenters and anybody that was really of substance, and they took them around the world. And so I, I looked at that and said, you know, I can't, I can, you know, I can't compete with them. They'll never get to promote Elvis or whatever. So what, what is it that I could do? And, and I, I looked, I said, well, they're not paying any attention to the new artists. So if I can put my ear to the ground and find someone new and promote them and they would have allegiance to me. And if I was right, someday they'd be big. And then I could, you know, they they would work for me and not for Concerts West. So what, so that's what, what uh, year are we talking about here? <clears throat> uh, 73. Okay. 
72, 73. So then I, I got a plan. So I started, a, 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 I bought a, a building in Roy, Washington uh, uh, that, that was large. It was an old International Order of Forester uh, and, and remodeled it. And I called it Judge Roy Beans. And, uh, and, and it could hold more people in there than, the, than was population of the town. And, uh, and so I had a foundation. And it was what I knew about it was why it would work. It was on the backside of Fort Lewis. So I knew that I had a, if I promoted it right, I had a clientele of soldiers hmm. that would come there and, and then anybody else I could get. So th I, I had that as a club. And then I went into Seattle and I leased uh, the Moore Theater, which was a 1500 seat theater there. Nice venue. Yeah, nice venue, but it had been sitting there dormant, and I just walked into the owner and said, hey, I want to lease your theater, and he let me do it. So now I had two places, and then I just started looking around for people that were new and upcoming and I'd, I'd going to you know, clubs and bars and listening, and so I, and I had enough plan. So I did, uh, I found, well, like Bachman Turner Overdrive in the beginning. And they were playing up in Canada in a bar and they had a manager, but they didn't have a promoter. And, I, you know, I made a deal with them and said, OK, I got some ideas. You come down here, I'll implement them. And I think I can break you in our, you know, in the market and make it happen. So taking care of business, right? Taking care yeah. of business. Exactly. Right so on. so I did. I, 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 I got a radio station to come in and promote the concert in there. And then and then they put it on the radio and then it was taken to other markets. So I started promoting them i play them in the bars and then the 1500 seaters 3000 seaters 15000 seaters and stadiums so over wow. a period of time i i grew with them and i did them in about 20 different states around the country so i i learned a lot and then i just started doing that over and over and over again with different bands i did it you know with super tramp and 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 then promoted and then i started promoting other shows and so i gained a lot of experience over a period of time and then in um in 1975 i saw hart playing uh my place tavern uh in seattle just south of the airport and i that was at the time when nancy had joined the band and i became a fan mm. and uh and then a friend and then became their manager and I, so then I had the basis of experience to, you know, what do you do about this? Because I knew a lot about the business. I've been doing it for, you know, four or five years. And so, um, so I, we, we in Canada I ended up going up there and making the Dreamboat Annie record, which was on our own with a small record company called Mushroom. And, and I was able to take that record and take it to, um, 14 different labels uh and nobody wanted it and they said gee you know women you know playing rock like that nobody will buy it and i'm going this is not right so so lots of no's and so basically i just had a belief in them and a vision for their success and i had a i had a uh, the resources in terms of knowledge about how to break somebody so i just bet the farm i sold my house i sold my car uh i took them on the road and i said to the record company mushroom okay we're just going to go from city to city and you follow them around with records and sell them and i'll i'll promote them and be their agent and manager and i put them on a salary and we just started going so we started out i got them on an april wine tour in eastern canada so we started out in early 76 coming across canada and uh and then just got i got them in the states just kept getting them on more and more dates and promoting them myself if i couldn't get anybody else and so by june we'd sold a half a million records and by august we'd sold a million and by the end of the year we were in europe and we sold three million records and all strictly through the efforts of you know a, a, a phenomenal band and 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 a band that just had extreme talent and then and then I had a plan in terms of getting them the exposure and making it happen. So, so I was, you know, I was able to all the time I was, you know, continuing to be a promoter and um, building my business there. And I managed Hart for, you know, around 10 years, took them around the world. You know, they were, they became superstars. And, yeah. and so that just, you know, led to, uh, 
you know, to uh, build in the Gorge Amphitheater and then uh, going on and, and uh, you know, I, we, I got, since I was a vet, I got into doing some uh, supporting vets and that's what the, that Carrier Classic event was, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which was doing uh, two NCAA top teams uh, on Veterans Day um, on a nuclear aircraft carrier in San Diego. And uh, we conceived that show. A friend of mine called me up one day and said, you want to go for a ride on a uh, nuclear submarine? I said, yeah, when? He says, tomorrow. <laughs> and so it was uh, the Nebraska, and it was uh, that was sometime before uh, the Carrier Classic. That was about in 2008. In that, on that uh, submarine, we went out to sea, and having a burger in the mess hall, the idea of uh, a, a, a athletic director had mentioned to somebody, gee, wouldn't it be great if you could do um, – you know, a basketball game on an aircraft carrier. And, and my friend uh, who was, uh, who had worked with me for years and years uh, in heart um, was, had a, had a lot of experience in, uh, sat had a satellite business. And uh, so we looked at each other and just said, well, this is something we can do because we don't need anybody else. All we just need is, you know, get the, uh, the ship and get a place to do it. So, we bought the time on ESPN, so the show we owned, and and we got the Navy after three years' time lease us a, a nuclear aircraft carrier, and we got Barack Obama and Michelle to come. And oh my gosh, and, amazing! And if, yeah, and if you look at that, if you look at that a show, uh, uh, and and it went out, it had ten million people watched it, and. That was one of those things, like the gorge, in the sense that magic happened that night on that stage. The sunset was perfect. The mm -hmm. ambiance was perfect. The president was there. I mean, it just couldn't couldn't have got any better. But it's uh, you know, it was just another magical moment. I'd like to back up a little bit because mm -hmm. you covered many decades uh, of mm -hmm. your life in a mm -hmm. short True. little monologue there. So going back to the mid seventies, you find heart playing in a tavern in Seattle mm -hmm. and um, Nancy had just joined the band at that point. Yes. Um, you are involved in the Dreamboat Annie recording session yeah. and that album launch. And then you, you know, build them up and mm -hmm. promote them. Mm -hmm. So um, my, my recollection when I interviewed Roger Fisher and Michael Fisher, it was in, they were at the same time. Mm -hmm. I think they said that Michael was, a quasi manager type mm -hmm. figure at the time. How did you interact with Michael? Like what were, what was your role versus Michael's? Uh, and, and for a frame of reference uh, for folks who um, may not have heard that interview mm. with Roger and Michael Fisher, Michael is Roger's brother. And yes. Michael is the one that inspired the song magic man. Mm -hmm. Um that is a famous heart song. And um, so tell me, tell us about that relationship. Um, and I know Roger and Michael left the band in the late seventies um, and you right. continued on, but how did that work? Well, so uh, you hit on a good point. So uh, for uh, quite a period of time, uh, Mike Fisher and Roger uh, were both involved with the band. Roger's a guitar player and Mike uh, was playing a, uh, a number of roles he, he was there he was acting as their sound man but he was also acting as their manager as they went around and at the time at the time they were playing now that i saw them he that was his role he was doing the sound and he was acting as the band's manager and bands need managers i mean that's a but it but i think what what occurred was that that it depends on you know it depends on the level of success that either gets thrust upon you or that you want to attain as to the type of uh, professionals that you would get involved in your career to get you to the next step. And so what was being recognized by the band and, and by Mike as well, and by, um, you know, the record company that, that, you know, you're on the precipice of trying to get from one level to another. And there is no doubt uh, about uh, how the amount of talent that was in that was in that band. I mean, all you had to do is, you know, just go see them. And if you loved music, you knew how talented they were. But especially 
Well, it's still true today. It doesn't matter. It's just that the barriers to entry are a little are much easier today. But you it, you just have to have a path and you have to be able to act on what it is that you're going to do in order to get to the next level. And so so Mike's Mike Fisher's role uh uh, and he was, in, you know, he was involved with Anne at the time, romantically, and Roger was involved with Nancy at the time. So Mike Fisher's role at the point I became the manager of the band, I was the manager of the band, period. And he, his role then became, uh, he was he was doing their sound. And uh, and so as we, you know, as we went out on the road, he was he was out there. That was his role. He was doing that's the job he was doing, and and he did a good job. And uh, and my relationship with him was professional and good and i i you know he he always listened uh you know he had his own opinions as everybody does and you know as a manager i'm going to listen and 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 apply what i think is you know kind of best for the for advancing our mutual cause but that's that was really the evolution that's the evolution of it and and uh and they're you know obviously relationships come and relationships go and i have you know i have some um significant stories about uh, you know about things that happened you know mike in a professional capacity and and what happened to him personally is less it's less known to me but i just know that they you know that their relationship soured and right. and and he and and the same thing happened ultimately with roger mm -hmm. but it's also you know you know, the uh, a relationship within a band is just no different than any other personal relationship, except it's a lot more intense. And 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 it's it's also when you when you have to go out and pour yourself into uh, into uh, working as hard as that band had to work. I mean, we were doing, you know, six and seven days a week. Um, we were doing multiple shows. Uh, you're you're traveling every day, you know, you're just, there's a lot of compression that goes on. And then everybody that's been in a relationship or that has been in a professional, you can kind of sense the different variables that could happen, except that they get a lot more, uh, they get a lot more intensified and, and, and artists regardless, uh, uh, have a, have a whole other dynamic that goes on, um, you know, it, with their personalities and in their lives that make them vulnerable, uh, you know, in, in, in many different ways. And so th that just that you don't have to look around very far to see, uh, you know, some of the unusual dynamics uh, that happen to all artists. And and, you know, it's just human nature when generally when you have some very keen, acute uh, skill uh, and especially in artistry in one way that you may have a great failing in another or at least not uh, have, have as great a success in your personal life so so that's a as artists are just really special in the sense that you know we tend to as consumers and fans we tend to look at an artist and 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 elevate them and and think that uh, whether they whether it's the characters that they play or the songs that they sing or whatever they have we tend to think that there's a there's an uh, there's a uh, an area of perfection that everybody's life attains once you have all the success well it's just simply not true and it's and it's and it's simply not possible to to maintain it without an incredible uh amount of work uh you know to to remain sane and to and to keep doing your art and to be right. successful and I mean it just is there's a myriad of difficulties in fame and and so when you apply it uh, when you apply it to it's no different in a rock and roll band and when you're out there doing this doing your work uh, there the, the, there's a dynamic that's going on um, and you know what I would always say is that's why bands have managers you know and so that's <laughs> you know that's what you do right. So when did you meet my dad? What year? Well, early on. So that, that really goes, that's these layers that, that, that I'm talking about. So uh, early on with Hart, uh, and, and especially because of the dynamic of, I was working for two women. They were my bosses. That's who I worked for. They were the, they were the leaders of the band. And, and that's, and not all, I mean, I was responsible to everyone, but I, I was also, I had a unique dynamic because of 
of of what I knew about the rigors of touring. So uh, I knew that grinding it out in a van or even a bus is not conducive to being in of the best mind at seven o'clock or eight o'clock in the evening to put on a great performance. So what my whole thing was to try and to smooth out all those bumps in the road on a daily basis to have things be the same, have there be standardization, have there, you know, you always had lunch, you always had a sandwich, you always had dinner, you, you, you kind of always, you know, got to bed at the same time and we got up, at, you know, and, and there was just something that was as normal as we could make it. That was your for, military background there. Huh? Exactly. It's yeah. exactly. It's what I, it's what I learned in the military and, and it's, it just really does apply. And, and fortunately, uh, Ann and Nancy were military brats. They had a <laughs> military dad. Uh, I love the guy he knew. And he looked at me and said, you know, take care of my girls. And um, so they were, they were understanding that, you know, that kind of idea. And so, uh, so early on, you know, we had been through the uh, experience of, uh, you know, running into a moose in Canada you know, in a van and mm -hmm. all of that, you know, all of that uh, close. Uh, That's so on brand for Canada. I... <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so what I was looking for, uh, and I had started, I had started flying in the military. And so I, I mean, I had ideas about it and whatnot. So I really wanted to find a way that, um, that I could have a, a, a continuum of travel that we could afford. I mean, we had to afford it. We weren't, living high on the hog and it wasn't going to be, you know, something we couldn't afford, but we had to be able to go out there. Uh, and the very ability to do that meant that we could work more shows, be more organized, be more comfortable for everybody as we did it. So I started looking around uh, to try and find, um, you know, try and find a way to do that. And, and it was by chance almost that, uh, at that same time, your dad was working, uh, you know, for executive aircraft. He had really founded it. Yeah. And at that time, they had they had purchased a brand new King Air 200, which was a for the time was a fantastic turboprop, held quite a few people safe. Uh, and so uh, I, I ended up just calling over there, getting in contact with him. He flew the plane over here, uh, you know, and then we immediately bonded on a personal level because we had both gone through uh, officer candidate school OCS mm -hmm. in the right. army. And, mm -hmm. and when it's weird, but you know, it's sort of like being, uh, you know, in prison together or whatever, when you run into somebody that's <laughs> experienced what you, the hell that you, you go through to get the through one of those trauma. deals, the <laughs> mutual trauma, you look at each other and, and because you talk a whole different language and you, ex but you have experienced exactly the, the same thing. So, so we, you know, we bonded on a, you know, on a military level. And, uh, and so, uh, so on a personal level, we really connected. And then he, he knew my interest in aviation and flying and stuff. So anyway, we, we, we started out, uh, trying it basically trying out the king air and it was so incredible that we started you know we just started integrating it completely into our everyday travel and um and so that's you know that's when i that was my first uh, introduction to him and then we just over time i'd see him every day and you know and and, and we were the sane people in the crowd you know and we'd uh <laughs> uh and, you know had a lot of mutual interests and and he loved music and and you know between that and our military experience and whatnot, we just became, you know, really fast friends. And that's probably before you were born. I, I was mean, born was, in 71. Uh, so I was still yeah, you know, uh, you, uh, very young, very yeah. young at that, at that <clears throat> point in time. So with Greg, we're, I was probably talking 76, early okay. 77 that we, right. that we actually started working together. We'd done mm -hmm. a few, few things, not, not, you know, uh, King air related, but then, then we started just, you know, exclusively having him, you know, fly for us and then me getting me getting to know him. And then our, you know, on a personal level, we just had, you know, an enormous amount of, uh, you know, excursions and fun times doing all sorts of, uh, you know, other things. Uh, you know, basically, we flew around the world together. Uh, I mean, he and I, <laughs> he and I flew 
uh, uh, only uh, we were the only two on the airplane. Flew that King Air to uh, over to Europe and uh, had all you know all sorts of fun along that that way. And we had yeah. to you know you, the, you're in the air a long period of time, and only one of you is going to stay awake for you know. So that's what you do. You you know you just take half an hour on, half an hour off, hour on, hour off, and mm-hmm. you know you just get going. So so uh, and, and then he he uh, <clears throat> I I got really serious about flying. Uh, I got, I got uh, type rated in a number of different, you know, aircraft from a Gulf stream to, uh, you know, some different jets, uh, uh, jet commander and whatnot. And that's where, and you know, I've talked about this, your dad, he's the first guy uh, I knew to have a satellite phone and, and, and he did a lot of other, you know, different activities. And so we both got type rated in this, in this uh, Israeli aircraft jet commander type plane. And then um, uh, I'd get a call. I got a call from him one time and he was over with Yasser Arafat uh, teaching him how to fly this, <laughs> this uh, West wind jet commander airplane. And then right. he sent me a, a, you know, a Polaroid picture of him. And uh, mm-hmm. which is, again, that's just, that's just Greg. That's what he did. Did he ever tell you how he ended up with Yasser Arafat, the, the kidnapping story? No, I don't think I heard that. Okay. So <clears throat> I'll try to be brief because I know we've been going a long time. He's in a hotel lobby in Beirut. Okay. And two men come mm-hmm. and grab him, one on either arm, and mm-hmm. say, you're coming with me. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, they both are armed, obviously. Mm-hmm. And so he goes with them and they put him in the back of a car and they put a bag over his head. Oh, boy. And, uh, they, uh, and he thought it was over at that point and had no idea what was going on, but they finally um, took the bag off of his head after they got to their destination and they were in Yasser Arafat's office. Mm. And uh, so the idea was that uh, Yasser wanted him, had heard through the grapevine that my dad was one of the few pilots who knew how to, how to navigate Mm. no fly zones and the complicated airspace in the middle East. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. And, and just wanted to hire him as his pilot. Mm-hmm. And my dad was already working for a um, Saudi uh, radio magnet at the time. Mm-hmm. And so he, you know, he politely and, um, you know, with a great deal of trepidation told him he could not work for him, but still mm-hmm. was managed to get those pictures. And I, I have mm-hmm. those pictures on my, my uh, laptop back <laughs> background to this day, because it just, it's such a, a funny story. Now, do you have the one where they got they got their arms around each other? Uh, yes, yes, okay, I, so I do. I'm going to trade you for. I have the one where they're shaking hands. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, I'll, so see if we'll, I'll send you the. I'll send yeah, you that one. We'll do the same. Be, it would be a fun thing to have. You know, um, uh, your dad had the, had an un, some unbelievable um, skills, and I experienced them, and I can attest to them as being impossible to attain by anybody and uh he he could interpret um and, and and you know basically an analog map that showed the how the ground was supposed to be in terms of elevation and hills and valleys and uh ways through it and he could and in horrible weather and not using instruments he could find his way uh through those places and it's i mean it had to be it has to be some kind of uh you know sixth sense kind of deal because it's not something that humans can normally do i'm telling you for a fact and i've seen him do it many times when i was flying with him you know going different things and and i I, were you aware of his uh of his you know insurance recovery kind of aspect of his career for I, aircraft. I knew a little bit about that. He would investigate uh, plane crashes and uh, be on mountain sides looking at yeah. debris and do investigations and whatnot. Well, yeah. an- another another part of that uh, investigation was that insurance companies would hire him to recover uh, aircraft that had been stolen and used for drug deals. He was basically a repo man for uh stolen aircraft that are in other countries Mm. and it's a and when you have the skills that he has 
uh, not only, you know, not only the stealth ability as a military person to, you know, kind of execute and get things done, but then when you could navigate your way out of them uh, and, and, and bring things back and it was really profitable. And, you know, I had the experience and privilege of going along with him on some of those deals. And they're really, uh, you know, quite interesting to, <laughs> to say the least but and he did a lot of that and with helicopters and fixed wings and you know a lot of other stuff and he was really uh you know he was just an amazing guy in in his in his ability to do things and he's the most amazing pilot i've ever seen let alone being a great friend uh yeah i've heard a lot of stories from his friends and most of them after he passed away mm -hmm. unfortunately and, mm -hmm. and so i didn't know a lot about him because he was so um, he was just gone a lot, as you know, he yeah, was yeah. around the world traveling and on these adventures that he didn't talk to me a lot about. So learning right. about these stories through friends like yourself, it's really awesome that you're sharing that with me. Um, another story I heard from a, a friend of his named Gene Spidell mm -hmm. in Yakima. I don't know if you know Gene or not, but <clears throat> Gene was at a Caribbean island and I forget the name of the island, but he was there with his wife. His wife took a helicopter tour. The helicopter crashed, killed everybody on board. Mm -hmm. And so Gene hired an attorney to investigate the attorney um, because Gene knew my dad, uh, hired my dad to go down there and investigate. And mm -hmm. um, he did, uh, it ended up getting all of his photographs stolen out of his hotel room and left the island with not much because all of his materials and his notes were stolen wow. and then they but they held gene uh the police held him they, they took his passport and oh, they wouldn't wow. let him uh, leave the island until because they thought maybe there was some foul play uh so gene called my dad and this is a story that gene shared at the funeral and uh, gene called my dad and said you got to get me out of here they, mm -hmm. they took my passport i don't know what's going to happen mm -hmm. this does not look like uh, civil rights and and criminal justice uh, favors the accused is so to speak here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so they planned an escape and my dad flew down and the plan was I'm going to land this plane and I want you to be at the airport and uh, I'm not going to stop the plane. I'm going to mm -hmm. keep rolling, but I'm going to mm -hmm. go slow enough to where you can jump in. And that's what happened. He landed the plane at a coordinated time. Gene was there, saw him land, ran out onto the airstrip and jumped into the moving plane. <laughs> without a passport and then my dad took him back to the states safely and he was able to uh you know escape that whatever kind of uh, kangaroo court system they were going to put him through there but um that's just one of the you know many stories that are pr there's probably countless other stories that are out there about my dad and the adventures that he was on uh with uh with friends it's really true and i i know i you know i personally know some other people that could uh uh, tell you some other stories that we, that you'd find interesting. And, and they're all, you know, they all really also speak to your dad's character, which was, he, he was just a great guy. And, um, he always was interested in helping people out. He was, a it didn't matter who you were. He became really good friends with everybody in heart. He was, uh, he was really a part of the part, uh, integral part of the team and of the family, as it turned out, when you just, you know, when you went, when you go around and, and, and do things and, mm -hmm. and, and we, uh, later on, you know, um, ended up, um, uh, uh, buying a Gulf stream. And then he, um, he just basically took over the flying and management of it. And we ended up, he flew a whole bunch of other people around on tour, uh, other artists and any, everybody from Joni Mitchell and kiss and much other people. And he just, so he became, uh, you know, notorious somewhat in the, in the music business, in the touring community for that. And people would call and want him, you know, to, I remember uh, to be I, their pilot. That's when my, when I became musically conscious was when I was about 10 to 12 years old. And I started to see these boxes of concert t-shirts uh, come back with my dad, Def Leppard and John Cougar Mellencamp and mm -hmm. Joni Mitchell, Neil Young, uh, Men at Work. A lot of bands from the eighties hard, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. but, um, when, when my dad died in 03, I remember my sister 
made contact with Carol Peters, who was mm. the manager at the time of, uh, of heart, mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. And, yes, she was. And, and wanted to just tell her that Greg mm-hmm. passed away. Cause I think she knew that there mm-hmm. was uh, still a connection there. And right. Anne and Nancy were so kind to send emails through mm-hmm. Carol to my sister, mm-hmm. sharing stories about the type of man he was to them and what mm-hmm. he meant to them. It was just mm-hmm. really, really special. But one of the stories they shared, I think it was Nancy who said that the, the scene from almost famous mm-hmm. uh, written by Cameron Crowe, yeah. where the plane is about to crash mm-hmm. and <laughs> it's a, it's a comical scene, but it's yeah. based upon a real life event where my dad was flying and they had to emergency land in a field. Mm-hmm. And um, I, <clears throat> I heard so I read that story, and then I watched a documentary about uh, Shep Gordon called Supermensch. I don't know if you've ever seen right. that documentary. Yes. But so Shep tells this story about how he was on the plane with Alice Cooper and Cameron Crowe when that happened. And that scene from the movie was inspired uh, by their experience. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wait, that doesn't really line up with the email that I just got from Nancy. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I, I Facebook messaged Shep Gordon Mm -hmm. and I said, I I was very diplomatic about it. I wasn't trying to confront him or anything and call him a liar. But I said, you know, I saw your story in the documentary. I just want to make sure, you know, I understand what happened here. And he's, he was just adamant. He was adamant that that happened he was on the plane. Alice Cooper was on the plane. It was not Hart, and um, and then I ended up interviewing the uh, <clears throat> one of the partners of Cameron Crowe in Vinyl Records. His name is Greg Mariotti, mm-hmm. and Cameron um, was too busy to do an interview. Right, but I had met Cameron backstage in Houston at a mm-hmm. at a Hart concert at one point. Mm-hmm. And this was uh, right after Fast Times at Richmond High came out, or a few years after. Mm-hmm. But <clears throat> anyway. I confirmed through Greg who talked to Cameron that in fact, it was my dad's flight with heart that inspired <laughs> that, that yeah. emergency landing in the field that inspired that scene and almost famous. And uh, were you on that plane at the time when that happened? Yes. And, and I have another, I have just have another piece of confirmational uh, uh, accuracy in all of that. So um, I first met Cameron Crowe, uh, sort of, if you looked at that scene out of uh, uh, Almost Famous, where the, he's a Rolling Stone, you know, kid, and he's going out on the road. Mm-hmm. Well, the the place that I met him was uh, in Fargo, North Dakota, and Cameron had been assigned to write an article about Bachman Turner Overdrive. So I was oh. there pro- uh, promoting the show, and Bachman Turner Overdrive wanted nothing to do with this punk kid he looks like he's a baby what are we gonna do are you kidding you know that was the whole dialogue but you know he ended up doing the interview and you know that's where i first met him and and uh and and i had met him out on the road you know some other times and he 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 ended up writing a great article about them and uh so time marches forward and then when I started managing Heart and I had the Dreamboat Annie album, I ran into Cameron again in Portland, Oregon. And, uh, and I think it was at a, another David Bowie show. And I, I gave Cameron this album and I said, and it was Dreamboat Annie and it, had, it was the album. I said, Cameron, you've never heard about these guys, but let me tell you, this is a band that I manage and they're going to be huge. And so, uh, you know, so that was his kind of first introduction to them. And then over time, he, you know, he had a, uh, uh, Neil Zolzauer was a photographer guy that was his roommate and, and, and Cameron started, you know, coming to shows anyway. So he ended up meeting Nancy and then, uh, and then the rest know, is history, rest is history, as they say. Right. That's fantastic. So you were on that fateful flight then. Uh, yeah. Now there, and there is more than one, uh, okay. fateful flight and I can, <laughs> uh, and, and here, and, the uh, and your dad is pivotal in these because um you know obviously there's a certain element of urgency uh when you're out on tour about getting from a to b on time and there's a lot of stories of where that didn't turn out so good you know when you Mm -hmm. you know you got leonard skinner and not enough gas in the plane and all the other things that can go wrong 
But the thing that you could count on with your dad was that you were going to get there and it was going to be safe one way or another and you weren't going to get killed. And so but uh, but it's when you start touring in, in, you know, places where there's tornadoes and and you're always flying in the bad tornado time of day, you know, when the odds are that you're going to get them. There's a lot of, um, you know, perilous moments because you're, you know, you're you're flying your way around uh, using instruments and things that detect where the tornadoes are and all of that. But it's it's, you know, you sometimes really get uh, anxiety, for lack of a, a better uh, mm-hmm. term. And and so, you know, so. It, it, one of you know one other interesting story along those lines was uh we were we were flying with heart to um uh, we're going to puerto rico and then from there we're going to play the dominican republic and all along the way we had to fly through the uh you know the an area where strange things uh oh the bermuda triangle the bermuda triangle where all sorts of strange things have happened over time so uh so so greg and i were flying the Gulf Stream and uh, and and we're coming up that area. It's night, it's dark. You can't see anything, and and just strange things started happening on the airplane. And uh, so, you know, the one, uh, one first thing, first my first inclination of, and the airplane was packed because we were had crew and band and everybody, so we had a lot of people on there, and there wasn't a lot of room. And you know, that's kind of another dynamic. But um, the first thing the road manager, Dick Adams big tall guy comes up and I think he'd had a few too many beers, but he says to me, uh, man, my wallet got hot back there. I go, what are you talking about? He said, I don't know. He said, my wallet just started getting hot. And he said, I had to take it out. And I said, well, did you dump some beer on it or something? Or, you know, how did that happen? No, but I don't understand what was going. So, well, okay. So I'll take that. So the next thing, maybe 15, 20 minutes later, um, and, you know, you got an autopilot on when you're flying at night. There is no horizon. You can't see it. And you depend on the autopilot. And there's supposed to be an alarm on the autopilot. If the autopilot switches off, it's supposed to make noise. And you're supposed to call attention to it. And then you fix it. So we're flying on an autopilot. And then we're going over the Bermuda Triangle. And, uh, and I just happened to look down at the instruments. I mean, you don't, you look at the instruments. And I see that we're in like a right 60 degree banked turn. Oh, and which no. is which is near the end of the hunt. Yeah, that's you know, like a JFK uh, Jr. moment. Yeah. And, oh. and, you know, those things happen very mm-hmm. slowly. And so what had happened is the autopilot had turned off, made no noise. You know, all of a sudden, you know, we, we were probably uh, 30 seconds away from being upside down. And so, OK, so right. If you recognize it, it's just very don't do anything, you know, just slowly, you know, <laughs> bring the aircraft back using instruments, turn the autopilot back on, test it. And, uh, and you know, it, and it worked the second time the, uh, the alarm went off. So anyway, okay, that's an incident. It happened. Then we're autopilots on long. We're flying a, a, along a little while later. And then uh, I hear this incredible bang, really loud bang. Uh, and Greg, Look, and I look at each other and go, you know, what the hell was that? And we just start looking around. Well, long story short, uh, his windshield, there's three windshields in, in most of these high flying aircraft and, you know, uh, an outside one, a uh, middle and a interior and one's heated and one's, uh, uh, you know, designed to not let birds penetrate. And the other one's, you know, defrosting thing. Well, the, uh, the outer one had basically disintegrated oh my and goodness. for no reason. I mean, we're just up at altitude. We're flying along. There's no birds up there. I mean, we're way above the birds. And so, you know, that happened. And then everybody in the back, I, you know, I, I was talking to Ann and, uh, you know, last week and we're talking about this particular one and she was going, you know, for us back there, there was all, there was all, a, a myriad of different things that happened anyway. So, you know, then we yeah. land the plane and, and, and I'm, I got to land the plane this time. Cause I'm, I have a windshield and Greg doesn't, and, you know, so it's <laughs> like, but, but anyway, so the, uh, there's a continuum of, of stories that kind of go together in all these things that. Yeah. 
near, near interesting. misses, near death near misses, experiences. Oh, you know, somebody landing when we're landing and having to get out of the way and lots of that kind of stuff. So Ken, uh, th- this is a random question that I forgot to ask you during the gorge discussion, but mm-hmm. <clears throat> if I remember the movie correctly in 93, you sold your interest or, or your company sold yes. uh, to live nation. Uh, yes. Gorge. What was the reason for that? Were, were you looking for different challenges? Was the offer just too good to refuse? What was going on in 93? Well, uh, good question, because it was a very it was a dynamic time in the business. Uh, you, you know, there always is. But what was happening uh, was that, uh, you know, we we were uh, John Bauer and I were partners at the time and we were regional promoters. We had both come up together as a regional promoter. So you did shows in your region and for for us and me, that included, you know, Western Canada, Western United States, down into California, sometimes into Denver, sometimes. So we were regional promoters and then it would be analogous to, you know, the NFL has regional kind of franchises, except there was nothing written about it. It was just, that's how the, the successes of various promoters happened. Bill Graham was in San Francisco and Ron Delsner was in, you know, New York. And so regional promoters, a lot of them. And what I saw was that uh, there was uh, something happening with corporate, corporately that corporations wanted to uh, get in that business because it was high gross, lots of people helped their stock value. Uh, and, and there was a market for them to do it. And in my, my opinion, the one, the uh, regional uh, life was limited. And so, and I, and I talked to uh, my partner, I talked to John, I said, look, the handwriting's on the wall. Uh, I want to go out and see if I can find somebody that uh, and the whole goal, my the, the business reason behind me wanting to do the gorge and doing it was so that I could take a blue sky business, which really you don't have a lot of anything, buildings or tangible things you can sell. And I wanted to have, you know, put some real estate into it. And and so thus the gorge. And and I was I was uh, developing uh, several other. Uh, amphithe- amphitheaters around the uh, White River was one with the muckle shoots and mm-hmm. and uh, and there was another one up in in Canada and uh, Bellingham and so we had a lot of those developments going on and so I felt that better to be first than last if you if there was a move to be made then uh, w- we should probably look around to do it so uh, and 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 plus uh, John was in a horrible divorce at at the time that was going on. And so on a personal level, you know, he, he was having lots of up and ups and downs. And so, so I started looking around and, and, and going to different um, corporations and see if they would have any interest in it. We had this wildly successful amphitheater. It had just been voted for the first time by Polestar, you know, as the most successful amphitheater in North America. And it went on to do that another nine, eight times. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe this would be a good time. And with your question about challenges, I, that really was at work for me because uh, I, you know, my idea and I gained satisfaction from a business standpoint is taking on really difficult things or things that others, you know, might not be able to do and, and seeing if I could do them. And I had lived through that with heart and I had lived through that with the gorge and i had some other ideas of things that i would like to do so so i had a you know i had a personal reason that that would be okay with me so i shopped it around it's sort of like just shopping a record i got a business and you know shopping around see who was interested and i found a company uh, it started out as mca universal that was the original company so that was they had universal studios and and mca had a record company and they were Mm -hmm. the biggest at the time, they're one of the biggest entertainment companies in the world. They were interested in us. And so, um, so got into a negotiation with them, uh, made a deal in, 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 in my case, you know, it was a long-term deal because not only, you know, they bought our, bought our company out, which is basically buying your relationship with all these artists so that they can have a continuing relationship with them. Right. But also, so I had a, a 10-year non-compete and a 10-year consulting agreement. So mm-hmm. 
that just was what, you know, I knew that whatever I was going to be doing, I'd be involved, uh, you know, with, with the gorge for, uh, you know, a long period of time. And, uh, and so, you know, that was a motivation that kind of kept me in, kept me involved, kept me in the entertainment business at a level and then also, but would free me up to, you know, go, go investigate and do other things. And that's when I got into, uh, you know, uh, helping getting involved with military activity. And we started taking, uh, you know, troops down range and, and Indy in astronauts and, and Indy cars and all sorts of different things. We did that and that ended up, you know, doing the carrier classic and we're still doing many other things. So that particular aspect of it. And I, then I got into technology. I really thought this was a pivotal time and, and it was a good time to get into technology and learn about it. And so I started a consulting business and, you know, completely ab absorbed all there was to know at the time about technology still in M to this day. So I, you know, I'm, you know, web pages and internet and all of that kind of stuff. And so that's, you know, all of those things are combined now into, um, you know, uh, they, uh, MCA Universal turned in, uh, they spun off into Universal Concerts out of their major company. So that was the next step in it. And then Universal Concerts, uh, y you know, uh, made a deal with somebody else. And, um, and so uh, House of Blues was the company and then and that so that house of blues then became house of blues and uh and and the predecessor to live nation became the biggest concert promoters in the world because they started buying up everybody right and there was a you know <clears throat> kind of a landslide landslide toward promoters selling to bigger companies and so then so then um clear channel you know that kind of whole concert thing turned into live nation so there was live nation and and house of blues big competitors so over the years they tried to buy each other you know back and forth and back and forth and then finally they they kind of merged and live nation emerged as driving it so the my good friend and and protege and uh uh guy that worked for me and and was was there and you saw him in the movie jeff trissler mm -hmm. yep was uh, w that started in 1988 when we did to the gorge working for me and he's is he's is still now he's risen through the ranks at live nation is still a great friend and associate and you know we work together on a number of different things and you know including uh what we, what we might be doing uh, in the future with induct the gorge so there's been a continuum with that and then you know it's kind of led to me uh i've I'm, I'm now gotten into movie production and and First, I'm going to, you know, get my book out there, complete this unbelievable thing with Induct the Gorge, and then lots of other cool stuff I'm doing. Right on. When does the book come out? It'll, it will, uh, it, I'm going to announce it, you know, kind of a pre-sale deal, tell some of the stories out of it right on the 20th, and then it'll, it'll go on sale, uh, you know, shortly after. It'll be a pre-sale deal, and then it'll be available through Amazon and, you know, then nice. it's just another... There's an ask for every seat. Nice. Oh, what a great title for a book and what a story you spun and, and shared with my listeners over the last two hours. Ken, you are so generous and your history within the music industry and entertainment is so impressive. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story and especially talking about my dad. I know my listeners probably are less interested in the personal stories about my dad, but Hey, this is my podcast, and uh, I wanted to uh, to learn about it, and you were kind enough to do that. So, thank you. Well, you no, know, well, thank you for having me. And and the other thing to to uh, you know, the other unique thing that you and I are doing right now, which is kind of uh, unusual, is we're kind of jointly uh, doing you know creating a podcast for each other. Right. So we're you know, and that's just that's that's just kind of a fun thing. So so you our interview and you and my interview with you and our stories are going to be are going to exist in two different uh simultaneous podcasts uh at the same time so that'll yeah. be kind of fun yeah i've never done that before yeah it's well, gonna be know, fun like i always say you'll never be able to say that again <laughs> ken kinnear thank you so much for being on the show and good luck with your book launch and also with induct the gorge i will be 110 percent behind that movement thank you so much brian Hey, 
Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle at DreamPathPod. And as always, go find your dream path. <laughs>